And in these streams that flow into mighty rivers are spawned the salmon that form half the province's $40 million a year fishing industry. Salmon always go back to the stream where they were born when it comes time for them to continue the species. Four years they are in the ocean, hundreds of miles from the rivers where they first swam. When spawning time approaches, back they go. Nothing save death will stop them. Up these rushing, foaming waters over jagged rocks and rapids, such determination is extraordinary. Fishways have been erected to assist the salmon around these mighty maelstroms. And on other streams, fish ladders, so that the fish may climb step by step. Salmon surmount unbelievable obstacles on their way to the spawning beds. Some races traveling as far as 700 miles from the sea to the headwaters of the Fraser River. If salmon cannot reach the spawning ground in which they themselves were spawned, they will accept no other, but will die without spawning. Just look at that fellow's determination. He's going to make it or know the reason why. There he goes, try after try, until he's over, heading for the spawning grounds. They may have quiet water for a time, and then possibly more rapids, until at last, worn and weary, they reach the spawning grounds to fulfill their destiny, the procreation of their kind. The salmon fishing and canning business of British Columbia, worth $17 million a year, has two types of fishing boats that operate in these long, fjord-like arms of the sea that run sometimes a hundred miles into the mountains. These gillnet boats tied up at a cannery are about 30 feet long and are powered by internal combustion engines with a one or two man crew. Generally, gillnetting is a one man operation. Gill nets are made of linen, with a cork line at one edge and a lead line at the other. Many women find employment making and mending the nets. This one is seen hanging the cork line, the corks being floats made of cedar. The cork line serves to keep one edge of the net floating at the surface. The lead line is hung in a similar manner with leads for weight to keep that edge of the net down in the water. And when the net is all out in a straight line, it is allowed to drift. The fisherman never knows what the result will be, but hopes for the best, for fish mean money and a hard job should pay well. When the salmon are migrating upstream, nothing will stop them. They cannot be diverted, as we have seen before. When they encounter a net, they persist in going on, and go they will until they are caught. Purse saners are much larger than gill net boats, from 40 to 60 feet long, and carry a crew of about seven men. Generally, they are powered by diesel engines. While the men continue to splash, the seine boat slowly moves forward, towing the end of the net and being guided so as to return to the point of commencement, thus bringing both ends of the net together. When the two ends of the net have been brought together, the next step in the operation is pursing up, that is hauling in on the purse line, which is threaded through rings fastened to the bottom of the net. Powerful winches do this job. Again, the orderly process of fishing comes in. The purse line is as carefully handled as you do your garden hose. It is neatly coiled on deck, each end in a different coil, so that when the net is being hauled in, the purse line can be run through the ring. In this way, there is less danger of the web becoming entangled in the ship's propeller which would be a first-class tragedy. There is a ton or so of lead to be handled, as well as the fish and web. And as these nets cost from four to six thousand dollars, the fishermen handle them most carefully, 
any break in the net and the fish will escape. And as the net is hauled, the fish are gradually confined in a smaller space. The web, cork line and lead line, together with the purse line, are all stowed on the turntable. And now commences another phase of the operation, bringing the catch to the surface. Such flapping and splashing and glint of sun on silvery bodies and churning of salty waters. So it's quite a bag full, worth its weight when the payoff comes. Salmon canneries are self-contained little villages, strategically located up and down the coast, all the way from the United States border to Alaska. British Columbia's salmon canneries are as modern as tomorrow. Fish come in one way, the cans in another, and then the filled cans are discharged at the bottom of the machine. Butchering isn't done by hand anymore, not in British Columbia's canneries. Grim-looking machines known to the trade as iron chinks do that job. The whole cannery is something like a streamlined factory, with the assembly line as the most efficient way of handling an involved process. The iron chink does a good job of cleaning, but despite this, every fish is examined individually. Women inspectors, shining with cleanliness, proud of their part in preparing this food product, look over each fish as it comes from the iron chink. This job is done under running fresh water. The full cars, each holding about 25 cases of 48 cans, are transported to the enormous cookers, which when filled are closed and sealed steam tight. And for an hour and a half, the cans of salmon are cooked under live steam pressure at 260 degrees Fahrenheit. and away go the processed fish to the warehouse. So hot are the cans that it takes 24 hours for them to cool. The cooled cans of salmon packed the day previous are next brought to the unscrambling machine, which is used to unload the cans from the coolers or trays on which they were cooked. British Columbia's canned salmon labels are favorably known throughout the world and are synonymous with the highest in quality. As the cans roll from the labeling machine, the labeled cans are packed into wooden cases or fiberboard cartons. And next into the warehouse by conveyor once more, from where they are shipped by truck, train or steamer to all parts of the world. The salmon fishery of British Columbia is an important part of the industrial life of the province. The salmon canning industry alone, which we have just witnessed, is worth in the neighborhood of $17 million a year to the people of British Columbia. Salmon fishing and canning gives employment to more than 15,000 persons, while over 9,000 boats are needed to catch the fish and transport them to the canneries. The salmon canneries scattered up and down the coastline of British Columbia form the nucleus of many small settlements, while British Columbia canned salmon has helped to spread British Columbia's name far and wide. In many parts of the world, canned salmon and British Columbia are synonymous terms. British Columbia canned salmon is exceptionally high in vitamins and many of the essential minerals, and contains more food value pound for pound than beef, hen's eggs, whole milk, and many other foods. From spawning in placid streams to packing for shipment, through the fascinating business of the actual fishing in the blue and green waters, amid some of the world's finest scenery, 
through the modern methods of canning to the warehouse and thence to the world. Such is the story of salmon fishing and canning in British Columbia.